good evening. I'm Mark Porter. I am the Exhibitions Manager of the Department of Exhibitions, Performance, and Student Spaces at Columbia College Chicago. Welcome to Getting Around Carbon, New Looks at Transportation Options. Um, this is the fifth program for the Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Science Scientists on Climate an exhibition of newly commissioned artworks culminating from a year-long conversation between seven artists and seven scientists centered on climate change impacts and solutions in the Chicago region. Our series of programs places together scientists and artists to have a discussion that acknowledges the very real effects of climate change while focusing on solution-oriented ideas. The program was created through collaboration between Columbia College Chicago, DePaul University uh, Institute for Nature and Culture, and Terracom. We couldn't have done this without our sponsors and supporters, and especially with the support of the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the Illinois Science and Energy Found In Innovation Foundation. We invite you to join us in person at the exhibition, which is currently on view at the Glass Curtain Gallery in Chicago through October 30th. Uh, you could also visit us online at thirdcoastdisrupted.org and column.edu slash thirdcoast, where you can learn more about the artists and scientists involved as well as see future programs. Now I'd like to introduce Christine Esposito, excuse me, uh, the project director and lead curator of the Third Coast Disrupted and founder of Terracom, a 30-year-old environmental communications firm whose exchange project brings together collaborators to create art science initiatives like Third Coast Disrupted. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for joining us this evening and just choosing to spend some of your Thursday with us. We're very excited about our panel tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Melody Geraci is Deputy Executive Director at Active Transportation Alliance, where she is a top level thought leader and strategic manager in pursuit of the organization's vision that all people in Chicagoland have access to a safe, seamless, convenient, and connected transportation environment. One that is abundant with walking, bicycling, and transit options. She also oversees Active Trans efforts to become a more equity-centered organization. Daniel Horton is an assistant professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Northwestern University. He leads Northwestern's Climate Change Research Group, which studies everything from extreme weather events to the co-benefits and trade-offs of green infrastructure and transportation initiatives, to the evolution of Earth's climate system through geologic time, and the potential habitability of planets outside our solar system. Dan is one of our third coast disrupted scientists. Andrew S. Yang works across the visual arts, the sciences, and natural history to explore the cosmological flux. Exhibitions include the fourth Istanbul Biennial in 2015, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago in 2016, Spencer Museum of Art 2019, and the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, up oh, Natural History, yes, 2020. His writing and research appear in journals including Art Journal, Leonardo, Biological Theory, and Antenny. Andy is one of our third Coast Disrupted artists. For our program tonight, each of our panelists is going to talk for about five minutes about their work related to our topic and we'll have our discussion and we'll take questions at the end as well. First, a bit of a lead in. In Illinois, vehicular exhaust is the single biggest source of carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide, of course, being a chief greenhouse gas driving global warming, impacting our health and safety. Though carbon dioxide emissions have been on the rise, it's actually a surprisingly small amount of CO2 relative to the rest of the gases in our atmosphere that is having such a significant effect. Andy's artwork for Third Coast Disrupted helps us visualize that relationship. So we'll have him set the stage of our getting around carbon discussion by telling us about his piece. Andy. A 
apologies, I was muted. Thanks a lot, Christine, and um, for having me tonight. And I really look forward to the conversation with Daniel and Melody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen to show a few images from the installation at the Glass Curtain Gallery at Columbia. Um, that's part of the Third Coast Disrupt Disrupted uh, Exhibition. So let me just draw that up. My uh, particular artwork uh, for this um, initiative is called Parts Per Million Planetary Aspirations. And um, it derives its name from the idea that uh, we measure and sort of make sense of and quantify a lot of these effects of think greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide on a parts per million basis in the atmosphere. And, um, you know, given that uh, molecules are so diff diffuse and so abundant, the question then becomes like, uh, even though, as Christine said, um, the transportation makes a small amount of, uh, relatively speaking, of some of the CO2 emissions, there's also the fact that CO2 itself, uh, as a greenhouse gas, actually represents a relatively small proportion of all the gas in the atmosphere. And so there's something really interesting about this sort of um, inordinate impact. And so for parts per million planetary aspirations, I wanted to think about how we might visualize um, the role of CO2 and its outsized impact on um, the atmosphere by really just trying to see the atmosphere itself. What would it be like if we were to actually see all of the completely invisible because they're so small air molecules that are around us at every given moment at this sort of parts per million scale. And so um, what I did was I created silk screens with a certain number of dots. And what you're seeing here are uh, a couple, two different screens, one's sort of denser and one's diffuse um, overlapping that are supposed to sort of evoke the sense of air molecules. So the idea would be that each, if each dot is an air molecule in glass curtain gallery, I wanted to be able to then create a sort of atmosphere within the room that represented uh, the CO2 and the air and the nitrogen and the carbon, um, sorry, the oxygen that w is ambient there and that we're also, you know, producing breath by breath. And I also would position the silk screening uh, over paper in different ways. So this is actually silk screened over um, a piece of graph paper that measures temperature uh, in a room by the hour, uh, sort of evokes both the sun, but also a circle and a cycle, but is literally also one of the kinds of graph paper um, that you would use. And so the other sense of this piece was to think about data, that the parts per million idea is also data. And what we're kind of seeing are streams and streams of data over time that are helping us understand um, these issues around uh, global warming and climate change. So to that end, basically what I ended up doing was silk screening onto paper one million dots. <laughs> and then putting that up in glass curtain gallery. And so those are the one million sort of air molecules um, in space that themselves also look kind of like reams of data that could have come off maybe some computer printer in a, a atmospheric laboratory somewhere. And the sense was really to get an idea of the scale um, in this particular kind of way. Sorry, I don't have a person in here, but you can kind of get a sense that's about a 15 foot tall wall. Um, of maybe what a million dots would look like. But then within these one million air molecules, we have the situation where, and that's here just on that, this sort of lab book uh, on the front on a pedestal, those are 415 carbon dioxide molecules because carbon dioxide is 415 parts per million in the atmosphere. But that 415 is, is ridiculously um, influential and powerful, right? Since it's 415, um, dots or molecules, you could count the, those in uh, right seven minutes. Now, if you try to count all million, that would take you about 11 and a half days. And so here we have this gas that we've shifted from about 260 parts per million to 415 in a matter of 150 years. And yet that has the effect of um, completely altering uh, our climatic cycles and, and you know, our life on earth as it is. The only last thing I wanna mention before passing it off, um, is that there's also this sort of long piece of um, blank tracing paper in a sense that's supposed to represent um, the unoccupied space 
perhaps this, the CO2 we haven't yet added to the atmosphere um, and that hopefully we'll leave blank um, as much as we can uh, to try to mitigate the changes to the climate that we've already locked in. Um, but it's sort of like the sheet of the future, you know, of possibility. And those possibilities are both um, hopeful, but also scary and, and dangerous in many ways. And so it's supposed to represent that kind of uncertainty. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> that was great. Dan, take it away. All right. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And uh, thank you, Christine. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, present uh, what I have to say tonight. So um, I am a climate scientist, uh, an earth scientist. Um, and I study all sorts of different aspects of climate change. Um, and typically, I, giving a talk, I'd give a preamble and lots of introductory information, but tonight we're talking about transportation. Uh, and so I thought I'd make it short and sweet in terms of the preamble. Um, we know that climate change is happening uh, based on basic and not so basic physics and chemistry. We know that climate change is happening because of people uh, based on physics and chemistry. Um, we know that climate change has impacts on our environment and on our society, uh, and that all of this is driven by increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Lastly, we know that there are solutions to the climate change problem, and that's a piece of what I wanna talk about tonight. So uh, this is a plot uh, and it's kind of summarizes our problem, the, the problem that we have to fix. Uh, it has time along the bottom axis and on the vertical axis, it has global carbon emissions. This plot begins in 1980. It could begin in 1895 if we wanted, um, but it basically shows that carbon emissions are going up and have been going up for a long time. Uh, and it gives us a bunch of different options for the future where the carbon emissions could continue to increase through time, or we could take actions that would allow those carbon emissions to decrease into the future. Uh, what I really wanna talk about are those actions that could reduce the amount of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. And there's a host of them. Uh, you may have heard the, of these as mitigation wedges. Um, there's uh, considerations on how we generate our en energy, uh, how we, uh, conduct agriculture, what we eat on a regular basis, uh, our consumption behavior, our efficiency of all of these things, uh, and lastly, our transportation choices. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, but I, I present all of these with the idea that we are talking about transportation, but there's this is just one little wedge. Uh, it's an all hands on deck sort of uh, fight to prevent climate change. So in the US, uh, transportation makes up about 28% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So that dwarfs all of the other sectors that the EPA categorizes. Uh, so it makes it a, a prime target for us to attempt to uh, solve this problem. Um, in terms of uh, transportation, not only does it emit a whole bunch of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, but it also emits air pollutants. And the air pollutants from transportation in the U.S. are estimated to cause about 20,000 premature deaths per year. And so an obvious question when we're moving forward and designing a better future is if we solve the transportation carbon problem, can we also solve the transportation air quality problem? And that's where it gets into where we get into talking about electric vehicles. So electric vehicles, um, are interesting for a, a scientist like myself because um, what, it, what it amounts to is we have uh, inter what traditionally had internal combustion engines that are distributed across the surface of the planet. Each one of those individual internal combustion engines emit pollutants. It also emits CO2. Um, but in the world of EVs, we suddenly take the power generated at these individual uh, cars and puts it into 
uh, takes that power uh, burden and puts it into a power generation station so that you can charge your battery. And so it, it changes the spatial um, mix of emissions, but it also changes the actual chemistry. And so these are really interesting questions for someone like myself. Um, and we try to solve uh, or answer questions like this using sophisticated uh, models, climate models, chemistry climate models, so on and so forth. And we can play in model world and simulate uh, different realities in the future. So different levels of adoption of EV, different sorts of energy generation that might power these EVs. And so we've done that over the US. And I'll show you some of the results uh, that we have. Uh, so this is just the health, health impacts from one scenario. This would be what would happen if 75% of the, the vehicles on the road, light duty vehicles, so cars, passenger cars, turned electric immediately. Uh, on the left-hand side is ozone-related changes in premature death, and on the right-hand side is particulate matter or aerosol-related premature death changes. And so you can see largely positive changes for both of these scenarios, uh, with the exception of Florida, and that's due to their energy generation mix. So this plot speaks to the idea that um, Certainly there's, there's benefits across the board from a, from a health perspective, but we do have to be mindful of the, how we're producing this energy. Um, and then this is a, a somewhat complicated plot that uh, make, comprises most of the rest of my slides, but I'll walk you through it real slow because it has lots of important information. This is the whole US considered an aggregate. Um, and the first thing I'd like you to look at is the bottom x-axis, and this is the CO2 emission reductions. And so we've run a host of scenarios uh, 25% EV adoption or 75% EV adoption. And the punchline is that no matter what fraction of EVs we turn into, uh, what, what fraction of internal combustion engines we turn into EVs, we're always reducing CO2. And that's because a power generation facility is much more efficient than an individual internal combustion engine. So that's good news. On the left y-axis or the left vertical axis, uh, we have the, the number of premature deaths avoided, and this is annually. Um, and so what you're seeing here is that, again, in all cases, if we look across the US, we are avoiding deaths. We're not adding premature deaths to the mix because of the adoption of EVs and a change in the pollution. Now these are, um, somewhat concrete ways to look at this, but maybe uh, other ways to think about this are to turn this into dollar bills. Uh, so we can take these sort of numbers and, and contextualize them um, in terms of looking at damages avoided. So if we were to adopt EVs, what could we avoid in the future in terms of impacts? And one of the things we can do is we can translate carbon dioxide into something called the social cost of carbon. This is, these are the damages we would avoid in society if we did not emit this CO2. Again, very similar with uh, a statistic called the value of statistical life. <clears throat> this takes the life of an individual and puts a price tag on it. This is a somewhat controversial uh, metric, but uh, it allows us to at least put a value uh, that we can we can point to policymakers and say, hey, this is this is what we would avoid. And so, if we do this all in aggregate, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, if we adopt 25% of all of our internal combustion engine vehicles suddenly become EVs, we would save about 17 billion dollar and billion dollars annually. Uh, if we were to do 75% adoption, that's 70 billion dollars annually. And these are uh, relatively conservative numbers, and I'd be happy to talk about that if you'd like. Uh, lastly, uh, because this is a Chicago-based talk, I thought it'd be interesting to show some of my Chicago-based work, which is preliminary at this stage. Um, th you're looking at a plot of simulated ozone, um, and one of the fun things you can see in this plot is um, streets light up occasionally in white. And uh, ozone is a secondary pollutant. It's something that forms after cars emit their pollution, and then the sunlight interacts with it. And so actually near roadways, we don't see a lot of ozone pollution because cars are emitting a pollutant uh, that scavenges ozone and destroys it. That said, if we look at Chicagoland, 
uh, we can see where the EPA monitors are located, and then we can have a look at where asthma emergency room visits occur, and they largely do not coincide, which is a problem. It means we're not paying attention, we're not monitoring where the impacts are occurring. But in my work, I can simulate where the pollution is occurring, and you can see here, if you know anything about what Chicago looks like, uh, these pollutants, NO2 and, and particulate matter, highlight where the highways are. So the, the bright spots here are the highways, which suggests that it would be beneficial for Chicago to adopt electric vehicles. So we run a scenario where we electrify all of Chicago's municipal vehicles, and this is a change plot. So what we're seeing is a decrease in NO2 across Chicago and largely decreases in particulate matter across Chicago. If the city were to choose to electrify their school buses, their, um, their regular buses and their refuse trucks. And so this is all again, preliminary work, but we have other things in the work to look at light duty passenger vehicles over Chicago. And with that, I'll turn it over to, um, to Melody, who has an even better solution, which is don't drive at all. Thanks, Dan. Um, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, great. All right, well, while I switch, um, switch into my screen share, I will disclose that I am neither an artist nor a scientist. So I may be uh, discluded from this, <laughs> this particular panel. I don't know what I am. Um, I'm a uh, professional nonprofiteer and um, advocate. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Active Transportation Alliance just so um, you can, oh, you know what? I think I've got the wrong, oh, here we go. No, let me try something else. I think I had the wrong file up. Alrighty. Okay, so Active Trans is a 30 something year old organization. We've been around since 1985. We started off life as the, as the Chicago Land Bicycle Federation. So we were um, originally, you know, an all volunteer ragtag group of bicyclists who were tired of uh, getting uh, nearly run over every day. And uh, over the years, it's evolved to be a kind of a professional um, upstream policy systems, environmental change advocacy organization. Um, we're a member based organization. So we have about 20,000 members and supporters um, who act on our behalf. We couldn't do it without them. We have about 20 full time staff and uh, we serve the seven county greater Chicagoland region. I'm not going to bore you with mission and vision and um, long term goals and all that stuff. Um, what I did want to kind of pull out was that we have these four organizing principles and chief among them uh, is that mobility equity is um, central to accomplishing our mission. We really do believe that uh, forced coerced car dependency in society is inherently inequitable and that freedom of movement, um, particularly by walking and biking and public transportation is a civil and human right. And that that's what we're working for. Uh, I am uh, just sharing this slide by way of holding space for leaders of color in our movement. Um, we are trying to elevate their voices uh, as much as possible and step back and offer space. So if you're looking for some good reading, some great podcasts, um, other things like that, I recommend all of these, these uh, resources very, very highly. So in a snapshot, uh, Active Trans, uh, again, sort of believes that this extreme level of car dependency that we have in the US makes us all sick, poor, dirty, and unequal, right? <laughs> um, so the dirty part is what we're talking about tonight. Um, but we think there are all kinds of other social harms that come as a result. I'm not going to go into this, but um, there's, it's, it's just, we went down a rabbit hole in the United States around the, the end of World War II in driving and dr driving culture and driving dependency. 
and um, it was a racialized, um, weaponized racial um, initiative in many ways. But it was also, it also has, we have dug ourselves a hole that is so deep that it's going to be very, very, very difficult to get out of it. When, um, when Dan said, mentioned that, you know, changing transportation, giving people other transportation choices is a mitigation strategy, strategy it sure is. But um, the word choice is debatable. We have not only many people who are dependent on public transportation or walking or biking because they are unable to drive a car or cannot afford to own or operate a car, but we also have a much larger segment of this of this of society that has no choice but to live their lives with a car. They have to because we have set everyone up to fail with very few exceptions. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to live in cities that have good transit service um, are excluded from that. But most of America lives in the suburbs and suburbs were, were developed to drive. That's it. So um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight is a little bit of, I thought I would um, just delve into some of the data around transportation during the pandemic. Um, it's, you know, the COVID moment in time is being talked about as a reset for a lot of, a lot of different aspects of our lives. It's an existential moment, right? Um, there's a lot of panic around, you know, could this be the end of blank? Um, uh, politically, we're facing a lot of that, right? Um, so that's also happening in the transportation advocacy community. Basically, before the pandemic, th these two um, graphs are from March and from August of this year. And you can see that the number of trips being taken by car per day has bottomed out, right? Nobody's driving. Um, nobody has anywhere to go. <laughs> Not nobody, but a lot of people are staying home. So that, that is significant, but it's already starting to rebound. Um, just because people have stopped driving because they need to self-quarantine does not mean that they will not return to driving once this is all over. So um, it's a momentary glimpse into what life could be like if, we were, if we, there were not cars everywhere. Some of the other transportation trends we've been seeing happening is um, this overwhelming um, uh, demand for bicycling in many communities. Uh, you can liter you literally have to go on a waiting list if you go to your neighborhood bike shop because the, there are no bikes. <laughs> the manufacturers uh, have not been able to keep up with the demand. Uh, everyone is sold out of bikes. Um, might be getting a little bit better now, but for quite a good part of the summer, you couldn't find a bike anywhere. Um, and uh, we also know, you can see it in the numbers of the Divi ridership in the city of Chicago, the bike share program has set its all-time record um, in the month of August with 600,000 trips, which is incredible. Um, so, you know, obviously bicycling is an outdoor, um, non-enclosed way to get around. And um, you also can get physical activity and a little bit of mental, improve your mental health a little bit. So that's gone through the roof. Another thing that's been happening, and this is mostly in the advocacy community is, these empty streets have lit a fire under many of uh, the transportation advocates around the country in saying, we have, this, we have this unique moment in time, there's a sense of urgency over taking this picture of empty roads and being able to depict a different, an alternative reality to, to people. Like we never see roads that are this empty, right? So what if we put in these temporary installations of bike lanes and, um, you know, new sidewalks and, you know, playgrounds and just take back that public space and paint a different reality for people so that after the pandemic, um, we might have a little bit more sway in getting some of these things to become permanent. And obviously the biggest conversation has been around public transportation. Um, it has, as this headline from Time Magazine says, 
been apocalyptic for public transit for a whole bunch of reasons, you know. Um, obviously, people are afraid to be in an enclosed space with others due to, for virus transmission reasons. Um, the, the ridership has fallen off a cliff um, because people are working from home, but also people are terrified. Um, so the revenues are, are bottoming out and the transit agencies are in really bad shape. Um, they're, they were kind of a canary in the coal mine for what local governments are probably going through, going to go through this fall in terms of having lost a lot of tax revenue. So um, it's, it's devol it's, it has um, made much more visible a lot of built in weaknesses in uh, the way that we approach public transportation in this country, um, not key among them that that transit agencies are very, 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 very dependent on fares. And if they are a public service, you know, could you imagine if um, uh, your, the road going in front of your house was dependent on user fees, right? That just doesn't happen. It comes from our taxes, right? Not for public transportation. It's not done that way. We did a little bit of research into um, essential travel and essential workers during the COVID-19 crisis in Chicago. And we found, unsurprisingly, this is none of this, no, no one will be surprised by this, but that the um, communities that had, have had the most dire, felt the most dire impacts of COVID on their population, their COVID-related deaths, are also, majority brown and black neighborhoods with lower incomes, are also, also have higher percentages of essential workers who must, who are forced to travel outside the home. And those areas of the city also maintained higher transit ridership during COVID than the white and affluent communities. So um, as we've all been, been hearing, you know, we have essential workers who are in the most vulnerable and, and exposed to the most risk, um, both at home and having to get out and go to work. And for Active Transit's part, we've been, we have pivoted our entire mission um, toward working around the COVID response. And we've had a couple of, uh, some, some significant wins. We were, um, we were integral in making sure that public transportation got part of the first um, rescue package. And uh, so that was a big deal. That, that is gonna carry public transit agencies through the end of the year, at least, is what we've heard. Um, we also um, have urged transit agencies to prioritize their services for those essential workers that we found in those neighborhoods. Um, we also worked with the transit unions to um, push the agencies, Metro, PACE, and the Chicago Transit Authority for more PPE, more measures that would keep drivers safe. We also um, and this was a big one for us and we were kind of all alone on this this one we during the black lives matter protests um the city of chicago shut down the entire chicago transit um system shut it entirely down for more than just a day um to try and limit mobility of movement for protesters and the that was the first time they've ever done it in, in the entire history of the city of Chicago. Not even like the 1968 um, Democratic National Convention did they do that. They've never done that. And uh, we feel like it was a violation of people's right to congregate, right to freedom of speech, but also it harmed a lot of essential workers who were out there trying to keep us all fed and um, you know, run our hospitals. So uh, we organized a pretty big protester about that um, a petition and that's still going on. <laughs> and uh, finally, there was a Lakeshore Drive um, is being redesigned right now on the north side. And uh, those who were in charge eliminated a bus only lane option. So we fought to get that back in. Finally, let me just close by saying that um, looking forward, uh, if <laughs> just to put this in a sound bite, We've been doing, and this won't surprise anybody who's a climate activist, right? That we have been doing this incremental change, these tiny, tiny baby steps 
for so, so long, that's time for that is over. We, the only way to shift to get people out of cars, this is not a choice. It's not a choice for the vast majority of people. There is no choice. There has to be a massive paradigm shift in the way we build communities and the way we build roads, in the way we you know, decide on our land uses and develop real estate. Um, we have to make this happen uh, at the top level. It, it has to be um, a master approach or else it's just, uh, we will never get there. So that was a bit of a Debbie Downer, but. All right, Unscrare, unshare. If I can make it happen. There we go. Thank you, Melody. Ooh, does a lot there. Um, well, you answered one of my questions about trends. So, you know, before pre-COVID, post-COVID. Well, not, we're not post. Wouldn't it be nice if we were post-COVID? But um, where we are right now with COVID, uh, that's interesting. And I, I want to, I want to start by asking Dan a question about the research. Uh, and it, it does it dovetails a bit on what Melody was talking about equity. You know, we know that climate change disproportionately impacts low income communities and communities of color. And we know that those residents um, often don't have vehicles and rely on public transportation. And I'm wondering if the electrification data is granular enough in, in our region to tease out whether residents of our south and west sides would particularly benefit from a more regional adoption of more widespread vehicle electrification. So in other words, if is it reasonable for someone on the North Shore to think, well, I care about environmental justice, the air quality, especially in these most more heavily impacted communities, therefore my next vehicle is going to be electric. Now, this is in the context of what Melody said, we, need, we do need to make the shift. Um, but we also know that it, it, it probably won't happen as, uh, in, in a uh, quantum way as needed. So thinking about it within that context. Sure. Um, so just to sort of reframe slightly, which is to say, you know, I, I study electric vehicles because they, they have impacts on both the, the carbon budget, but they also have an impact on the, the air quality budget. And carbon is a gas that we consider to be really well mixed in Earth's atmosphere. Um, basically, if you emit carbon in Evanston or Chicago or wherever you happen to be, uh, we consider that to be well mixed throughout the atmosphere. Um, so the impacts of that carbon emission is going to be felt by people all over the world. And so disadvantaged people all over the world are going to feel the impact of those carbon emissions. And so right off the bat, you could live anywhere and um, adopting an EV because it emits less CO2 is a, is a win. Um, in terms of uh, the pollution side of things, we often think about pollution as a more local impactor. Um, so uh, one of the ways you can think about it, uh, pollutants is that emissions come out of tailpipes, they come out of snack, uh, smokestacks. And they often stay relatively close to where they're emitted. Um, and so when we're talking about transportation, it largely depends on where the roadways are. Um, and so if you have a community that's living near to a roadway, uh, particularly a highway, um, then certainly uh, adding EVs there would help. The other thing to think about in a city like Chicago is that there are all sorts of rail yards uh, there's all sorts of um, uh, Cicero yards where, where trucks just come and park and idle uh, for a long period of time. They're bringing goods and services to the city, but they're also polluting while they're sitting there. And while they're sitting there idling, they're actually um, producing more pollution because they're, they're not uh, running efficient. The, the, uh, the engine isn't as warm. Pollutants can actually be higher. 
Um, our study that we, we've done um, over Chicago is just looking at municipal buses, but certainly if we looked into heavy duty vehicles and we looked into um, uh, the light duty fleet, those would all have impacts. And if there is an intersection between a disadvantaged community and where people are driving, then yeah, certainly there would be positive uh, impacts by adopting EV technology. Which does make sense. Uh, even given your the graphic, uh, just looking at the highways, um, yeah, interesting. Um, I'm wondering, you know, taking this health idea a little bit further, um, lives saved through electrification. Uh, certainly, there, there's a health aspect and. Health messaging is something that has been used to promote walking and biking as alternative forms of transportation. So I'm wondering, and I guess the question might be for you, Melody, um, how effective has that message been? One would think that it would be effective, uh, health related, um, but are there lessons for applying it more, more broadly? For instance, sure. to this data perhaps. Sure. So. Um, <clears throat> two things. The first is that when we talk about health impacts of over-reliance on driving, we often don't talk about crashes. Um, we kill 35,000 people in this country every single year um, in car crashes. And that includes pedestrians and bicyclists too. So if we weren't driving so much, a lot more people would still be alive. Um, in terms of the kind of the physical activity side of it, you know, um, the public health community, and we, Active Trans works very closely with the public health community. In particular, we've been, um, we have been partners on a series of grants ever since the stimulus um, bill went out with the Obama administration, um, sponsored by the CDC to work on community level change, the social determinants of health, um, as opposed to the individual, um, influencers influencers of health um, public health folks for very much for a whole bunch of years right we're giving away t-shirts and water bottles and pedometers to try and encourage individuals to make an individual choice a change to go out and get that physical activity through walking or bicycling um, didn't work didn't work at all because you, again people are set up to fail if you live on an arterial roadway um, in the exurban part of the Chicago metropolitan area and cars are driving 45 miles an hour, um, <clears throat> that's not gonna be conducive to walking or biking, right? If uh, your neighborhood is unsafe for personal reasons, nobody's gonna do that. So CDC and, and the other public health professionals in the world finally kind of made a, a major shift in the way that they talk about improving people's health. And they have, they are putting much of the prevention side of public health is putting lots of resources now toward community design, the built environment, you know, food networks and food, solving food deserts, um, parks and green space, all those kinds of things, because your zip code determines your life expectancy. Those of you have probably seen those maps where, you know, poor communities, poor zip codes have as much as a 15 or 18 year gap in life expectancy to, as compared with affluent communities who typically have better resources for transportation. So um, I'd say the individual appeal to do the right thing, just like with recycling <laughs> or <clears throat> anything else you could point to in the environmental movement uh, is not going to get us there. There has to be a systematic shift, in my opinion. Yeah, interesting. Well, actually, to that end, um, this is a question uh, for more of the art side. I'm wondering what role data visualization, like Andy did, with parts per million um, planetary aspirations. What role could data visualization play in advancing the research, advocating for transportation alternatives and shaping policy? And can it be scaled up for public consumption, almost you know, marketing campaigns? 
know. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in terms of daily visualization, I do want in, I want to respond both to Daniel and Melody and also just show an example of what I think is very powerful data visualization just right here in my iPhone. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but that's, um, oh, no, you can't. It's uh, it's because of my light is very strong. But um, it's, it's, I don't know if you can make that black streak out. That's basically the exhaust coming out of a 22 bus that goes up and down Clark Street um, in Chicago. So I see the bus uh, every day. Now it only spews that big black plume of smoke every time it stops. But of course it's a bus, so it stops every block. And so, um, you know, Christine, uh, uh, it's a good question. And, and I, you know, I think this is a powerful form of, of course, data visualization. It's empirical. We see the effects of like um, petrol, petrol running um, engines on air quality, the way Daniel was talking about. Um, and it's so evident and it's, uh, it's really upsetting. And yet at the same time, it's really not upsetting. So we've become so accustomed. We have a real culture of low expectations around, um, you know, what we expect from our infrastructure and from our clean air or, or for, for whatever. And so that's where I just want to say, I think Melody is right on in that there's a real necessity to have um, change that also is structural and regulatory on a much larger scale. That's not because I don't think individuals can't make a difference, but I think especially in the American context, we just don't believe we can make a difference anymore. And we've become so habituated um, to a culture of low expectations again for what we expect for our safety and our well-being. And so we, if we see garbage thrown everywhere, if we see really polluting, polluted air from the bus, we just sort of give it a pass. And I, I think given that there's this need for sort of um, more widespread uh, systematic change. Um, oh, and I also wanted to correct myself. I'm sorry, I think I misspoke at the beginning of my presentation. I think I said that transportation was a small part of the CO2 budget. I was thinking in that specific case, I was, apologies, because it was a conversation I was having with someone earlier today. I was thinking about aviation uh, transportation specifically, and that's like whatever, 3%. That's certainly not transportation overall in the US, which is I think like you were showing, Dan, right? Upwards of like a third of the, the CO2, right? Emissions. Yeah, in the US, transportation is 28%, but that 3% number for aviation is global, I believe. Right, yeah, yeah, so sorry, when I was thinking about the transportation um, component, I was thinking about this global aviation. I wasn't thinking about transportation more generally, so my apologies. Um, but what role can data visualization play? Um, I think that it can't do anything on its own. Like, I think, you know, just to be quite fair and honest about things, you know, the kind of exhibition or the kind of work I did for Third Coast Disruptive, I think is, can be useful and important. I think every little small thing counts, but uh, it also necessitates context. And I think that's what's so important about journalism right now and the use of the way journalists especially and activists in general use data visualization and graphics otherwise to also make persuasive arguments. So one iconic image uh, of data, I just don't think, you know, of course for climate change, it's the hockey stick where we see changes in um, atmospheric CO2 change abruptly over say the last 800,000 years and the same we might see with like uh, mean temperature fluctuation, right? Um, so the hockey stick might be one of these iconic images. But it, when I mention that, I think actually only a few people have the hockey stick as an icon in their mind. And so um, data visualization, uh, whatever it does is going to have to be embedded in narratives uh, that like connect with people in their particular stories and in their particular places and um, have to be compelling. And so, you know, a very well-designed image matters, uh, but the way that people understand that image to matter matters just as much. And so I mm -hmm. think, you know, I do see a lot of bad graphic design or bad data visualization, of course. I, I found that actually in art making, you know, to say another thing about data visualization really quickly is that I think just the time it took me to silk screen 1 million dots, <laughs> and then the time it took me to do under the 415, and to think about these issues of scale. I was also thinking about the number, you know, of course, uh, upwards of 1 million people have died of COVID globally now at this point. So those 1 million dots on the wall could just simply be um, coronavirus mortality, unfortunately, in the past eight months. And so doing this practice of even generating that much stuff, knowing that a million is, is still nothing in the global context, 
also makes you realize just it gave me a new appreciation for the scale of the problems, the scale of the issues. And that, you know, but that at the same time, individuals and small groups do matter. Like, you know, a very strong activistic group, like the Alliance for Transportation, um, that can be the 415 CO2 molecules in a sense, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a better way, but right, like if a CO2 molecule can have such an inordinate effect, I think that very well positioned and, and key players in like a climate conversation or transportation or pollution conversation can also have an inordinate effect. And so I guess the part of the point of that data visualization work is weird in that this piece was to also point out that as overwhelming as it is, for better or for worse, um, small groups, small clusters of people or molecules can have, have a really large impact. Can I um, offer something? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move a little bit more to the um, advertising side of, of data visualization, but it, it's the art component of that that makes a difference. You know, there was a famous uh, public service campaign in London called Kill Your Speed, Not a Child. And it, the main visualization of that was a, 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 just a simple um, photograph split down the middle. On one side was a half of a child's face, on the other side was um, a skeleton. And the caption was, you know, every X hours a child is killed by a truck, you know, or something like that. And there was a measurable, very measurable reduction in the number of pedestrian um, crashes and injuries and fatalities um, as a result. I mean, or obviously it's a correlation, right? There's no ability to show causation, but, and you think back to all the great social movements, right? Of, of modern, the recent past, you know, the anti-smoking campaigns and all the, uh, the shocking, right? Visualizations there with, you know, showing blackened lungs on a big billboard. Um, uh, Seatbelts is another one. Seatbelts was a huge shift. Um, and it was done through visualizations of, you know, people in car crashes. So drunk driving is another one. So that's been wildly successful. So I think there is, you know, for the, the right kind of visual that's depicting data um, can really make a difference. I think it really can. With seatbelts, I want to also mention it also is Ralph Nader. I think like you know, the patron saint of, you know, I, I know a lot of people will hate me for the fact that I um, voted for him for president in 2000. But I mean, Ralph Nader has done more for um, public health, I think, in the US in regards to this transportation issue than a lot of people really appreciate. So I just want to give a shout out to him. Well, let's see, we're getting close to the end. And I'm, I'm seeing that we have one question. Um, from our guests, and that is a, it's a science question. A DePaul Institute for Nature and Culture favorite, Tim Morton, has argued that we can't understand global warming because of the huge time and spatial scales. However, I believe we can't understand the environment at any scale because we don't understand ecology or chemistry or physics. Dan, <laughs> what are some potential approaches to addressing this crisis of scientific illiteracy? Now, maybe it's another, still another art question. Um, well, I, I, this to me seems like, I, so I, certainly all members of society cannot edu educate themselves on everything. And this seems like a question of expertise and whether we value experts or not. Um, certainly, I've dedicated my life to trying to understand the atmosphere and how it behaves um, under different forcings and, and things like that and, and some of the net outcomes. Um, but there's other things that I rely heavily on from other people. Um, I still go see medical doctors when I have issues. I, I'm about to get a wisdom tooth drilled and I'm not going to do it myself. Um, so I, I think there's, and this is a a major issue in, um, at least in our country, the attack on expertise or experts um, and relying on, on voices of authority. Um, and, you know, there's, there's active, there's, there's folks active in, in eroding that trust. Um, how we build that back up, um, 
uh, I guess uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think probably some, uh, some evidence-based action um, such as relying on maybe leadership, relying on experts to get us out of a sticky situation. Um, I can think of one that's pretty prevalent right now that um, maybe people could listen to people that have thought about this before. Um, so that's my two cents. Can, can I say something to this question? Please do. Um, you know, I, I, I am also trained as a scientist. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a science educator also. So, I mean, I have a, a PhD in biology and I teach science at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago um, in addition to art. And I would say that um, it is, of course, an issue of scientific literacy, especially for people who are policymakers and who are in positions of, of inordinate power. But it's also a... Um, it, it's something beyond that. And that, um, you know, no matter how much you understand, no matter how much we understand, we still have an ability to abstract even the most obvious and visceral things sometimes. And so it becomes another question about also, um, again, making a compelling case. And there's so much we can say about how you do that and in what ways. Um, but, you know, I think it is clear that d data isn't enough. I do want to show one image though. So there is a data project um, that, um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly, if that's okay with everyone. So there's a project by a climate scientist um, out of the UK called Show Your Stripes. I don't know if any of you have heard about this project. Um, I think it's really interesting in many ways. And so the notion is that if you look at one of these, um, this is a, a graph that's showing you the chain, like global temperature over time. And the left is 1850 and each stripe is a year. To, to 2019, and you of course see um, the temperature warm over time, right? The mean temperature is shifting, and especially in the last, you know, uh, eighth of this graph to the right of the last 15 years. And you can look at different regions and look, or different countries, and then and see what the profile is. And so the Show Your Stripes project is meant to be like a way to, to communicate this sort of scientific data and fact of global warming in a way that they thought might be very compelling to people, but also a, a nice form of advertising. So if you look on the web, um, you can buy sandals uh, with the Show Your Stripes model on it. Um, you can buy coffee mugs, you can buy um, pandemic masks. So the idea is that, oh, if we popularize this and almost sort of habituate and memify this, this puts it into our consciousness. Um, and I don't know, I myself personally have mixed feelings. I'm not sure if it does or it doesn't. I did do a piece at the Spencer, I, I think this is a great project. And so I actually did a version of it using the data um, of this climate scientist whose name I'm sorry, I'm forgetting at the, at the moment, but maybe Daniel remembers right away. It's uh, Ed Hawkins. Ed Hawkins, right. Okay, so I credit him, but um, I will, I'll unshare screen for a second to show you another image. So at the Spencer Museum of Art this past year, um, I, I had a, an exhibition that had multiple components but one component was um, a um, wall piece that was basically um, share your stripes, uh, but that I turned into not uh, into a, a three-dimensional rather than a two-dimensional shape. And sort of my graphic design argument for this is that I don't feel like actually the urgency of, of global warming is as evident as it should be in Ed Hawkins is um, 2D uh, design, because uh, in his, that la those last stripes are still a minority. The red is a minority portion of the graphic, and it, it doesn't distinguish itself from any of the other stripes in a way. So if you're a scientist uh, and you're trained to read data, it makes complete sense. And uh, But if you're not, then how can you still be true to the data and yet at the same time communicate something with greater urgency. So I would argue that uh, my argument is that maybe this kind of visualization of that same data set is still true to it. It's just because you happen to be looking at one end, which is the time that you're fa that's facing you right now, the reddest part is where we're living. You, that's taking up more of your visual cortex. The red, of course, we know has a lot of semiotic value in terms of how we instinctually respond to things. And this actually makes the nowness of it much realer. Whereas in the two-dimensional version, you have left and right, but 
it treats every time as equal time. But arguably 1850 and 2019 are not equal times for us. Uh, this is the time that we have to act. And that's the time of the red that should be facing us most abruptly in the graphic, in the sort of a graphically designed image. So if you're going to create a graphic on this, I think it has to take in other considerations of affect and uh, communicability and urgency that's, that's just as authentic to the data, but it may, is legible to people who aren't necessarily just scientists. So that was just the one thing I'd say. Yeah, interesting. I, you know, we're, we're out of time, but I, I do want to see if, Dan, you, you want to, to say anything, like 30 seconds to anything you want to add to that. Um, well, I thought Andy did a great job of, uh, of, of talking through that. And, and he brought up what I always like to end on, and that's, um, you know, solutions. Uh, the solutions are out there, and, and really all it, it takes is um, society to act. And, and those actions can be, take a bunch of different forms. Um, probably the most important one in your immediate future uh, is voting. Um, we talk about systematic change and, you know, individuals don't necessarily, aren't capable of making systematic change. Uh, our representatives are, and that's probably the most important thing we can do uh, as individuals. Yeah, for, for everything we're talking about here tonight. Yes, I, um, I want to thank our panelists just with, with every one of our Third Coast Disruptive programs. I always feel like, oh, we're just getting going, but it's time to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank our panelists for such an interesting discussion. Thank you all for joining us. I, I, this is our final program of Third Coast Disrupted, but I just learned of a program today that people might be interested in, and I will tell you about it. It's a virtual screening of uh, transportation related, our topic for the evening. It's a virtual screening of a documentary called Life on Wheels, Transportation for a New Urban Century. It's November 12th. It's 6.30 to 8.30. It's hosted by Metropolitan Planning Council, the architecture firm of Perkins and Will, and SmartGo. There's information and registration at metroplanning.org. I glanced at it great, uh, briefly and it looks really interesting. We do have one more week for our exhibit, Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Scientists on Climate. It closes next Friday, the 30th, at the Glass Curtain Gallery, 1104 South Wabash. The exhibition is open to the public. Uh, we do, there are safety protocols, masks are required, and the gallery has capacity limit of 10. The flow of people through the gallery is, uh, I've never been in there when there are more than a few people. But if you're uncomfortable going in or you won't be able to before it closes, we are also working on a virtual uh, tour of the exhibition. You can visit Column, as Mark said, C-O-L-U-M dot E-D-U slash Third Coast and thirdcoastdisrupted.org for more information about the exhibition and to see recordings of our past programs. And this recording will eventually be up on those as well. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Good night.